The family went through a transformation in which we have essentially had a series of kind of secular rabbinical figures, academics and psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, but people who I think are doing some of the same work that rabbis do. And I believe deeply and powerfully in the power of faith and the Bible and both the Old and New Testament and the Mishnah and the Talmud as like some of the best and most amazing and important human stories. And I am super interested in ideas of faith and how it helps us contend with doubt and uncertainty. But I am not a believer that, as we have discussed, that God exists above us. I do think that whatever it is we call God exists between us. And so I'm like a secular humanist. But I am culturally very Jewish, and I believe in the gospel of love as a revolutionary force, which is what I think the good Jesus was talking about, and I think that is one of the great and and sadly unheralded revolutions. We have yet to live up to that revolution. So that is my religion. What about you, Big Talk? Mm, I'm a member of your church. You are? In in that regard. You're a naughty member of my church. You're always showing up late. That's right. I'm a non-Jewish member of your church, but no, I'm the same way when it comes to my sort of adult ideas about faith and God and religion. And I grew up really religion-free in so many ways. My mother was not an atheist, but she was what I think we now call a recovering Catholic. Mm. So many of my childhood memories, you know, when I think about religion, I think about the stories that my mother told me about her upbringing. My mother's mother was Catholic, is Catholic. She's still alive, my grandmother. And really imposed on my mother what what I think a lot of Catholic mothers do. You have to go to church. You have to go to confession. So my mom experienced religion essentially as an oppressive force. And she had to do. She should do. She had to be a good girl. And when she was a teenager, she came up against that in a couple of ways. One, she got pregnant before she was married, Hmm. which is a violation of you know, what you're supposed to do as a Catholic. Yes. And then she, later she got divorced. And so my mom felt really alienated from her religious upbringing. It was never her faith. Right. Okay. It, so, was, it was the dogma imposed. Right? That's right. And so she passed that down to me I, when I asked her about what's our religion. And, you know, as a kid, I think like a lot of kids, I wanted to be normal. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be like the people around me. And there was this time that I, you know, I wanted us to be a church going family. Mm-hmm. And so I would quiz my mom about this and I would say, well, what are we? And she would say, we're Christian. You know, that's our orientation. But God is so many things. So she introduced me to this idea that God is action and love, and it's not about going to a church or having that specific kind of identification with a particular branch of a religion. But, you know, in my adult life, I've fallen away from this in recent years, but when my kids were born, Brian and I decided to join the Unitarian Church here in Portland. Mm -hmm. And I love going to church. I found in the community of Unitarians, Mm -hmm. they seem to express the closest closest thing to what I believe to be true about the world and about the spirit and and faith. Yeah. We're in the same boat. And I actually felt this in my family of origin. There is a great and natural uh, hunger for community and for the things that we call faith belief, being able to live within our doubt and uncertainty. Religion didn't arise from nowhere. It arose from the deepest portals of our need to answer the baffling questions and to live in the uncertainty that it is to be a human who's alive and awake and paying attention. And you need a community, too, to assuage you. And I wanted that when I was growing up, and so did our family, but we didn't quite get it together. I had a bar mitzvah and did some studying, but it was like a hot tub bar mitzvah. It was very informal. It was at home and kind of improvised. And the most important thing that was missing as I look back, was that I didn't have a community. I didn't have a religious community and a religious tradition, which is different than a religion. We find our different forms of faith. Some people, it's the faith they have in a sports team, as silly as that might sound, or in books and literature and their love for that, or in a good community of friends. We're all looking for that sense of connectedness and fellow believers. The hunger for that is still very powerful, whatever you end up calling it. And I know that our listeners, a lot of our listeners, whether they attend church regularly or not, that is why they are drawn, because we still need community and we still need whatever it is that we call faith. Right. And so, you know, clearly this is what we're going to discuss today on Dear Sugar Radio. We're going to sink into a letter 
from somebody who is grappling with questions of faith. And even more specifically, and we'll get to it just right now, um, with the divide that exists between people who have a very clear idea of what God is, who God is, and how, in this case, he functions and what his rules are, um, and somebody who grew up in that faith with a very clear sense, a very clear dogma, a set of rules, a liturgy, a catechism, um, who has fallen away from that into another set of beliefs that put her at terrible odds with her parents and her family of origin. So here's the letter. Dear Sugars, my problem can be summed up in one sentence. I don't know how to tell my parents that I am no longer a Christian. The stakes just seem too high. My lack of belief means eternal damnation and more salient, eternal separation from my parents. It means they have failed God in bringing their family to Christ. It means that I can't be part of their community and life, which is entirely about God. My life is the opposite. I stopped going to church as soon as I left home and became a liberal, social activist, environmentalist, feminist, and now atheist. It took me a while to fully let go of God, but I just have too many moral conflicts with the church and monotheistic religions in general. This has resulted in me having a very different moral compass from my parents. I get uncomfortable about my parents not recycling, and they get uncomfortable at any mention of sex. I get uncomfortable when their church friends say homophobic or racist things, and they get uncomfortable when I participate in rallies for LGBT rights. I remember my mother asking why I cared about LGBT rights. I knew her worry was that I was gay. I'm not. And all I could think to say was, because I care about my friends. See, the real problem is I don't know how to be myself around my parents. Everything I say feels like it's on the precipice of revealing that I'm not a Christian. This is a constant fear to me precisely because we are so different. Any probe into my opinions or interests reveals the fact that I'm not Christian. Everything in their life is so Christian. I have no idea how to engage with it in a way that feels genuine. So we as a family don't talk about my faith or much at all, really. They know I'm not involved in the church, but I think they hope I still believe. I've decided to let them believe that because it feels like the kinder option. But as I get older, this has felt harder and harder. This Christmas, I went to visit my parents in Texas and spent Christmas dinner with their church friends. This was a particularly poignant Christmas because my grandmother had just passed away and Christmas was her birthday. My grandmother was the only grandparent I knew and my mom's best friend. I know she wants the same relationship with me, but that feels impossible. At Christmas, I didn't know how to be there for my mom as she talked about Grandma, quote, now being with Jesus. I watched as their church friends prayed for my parents and talked about God's will, and I sat feeling like an outsider. I see the good things faith has brought my parents, securing a supporting community for them in their new home in Texas and bringing my dad out of a depression. But I feel so distant from them. My parents have been incredibly supportive of me my whole life, and I'm so privileged to have them. But I feel a crushing guilt and extreme discomfort every time I'm around them. I don't know if having an honest conversation about faith will help, we've managed to manufacture a kind of peace. Will telling them my religious decision actually help? It won't change anything. I worry it will feel like I'm rejecting them, that telling the truth will actually break down communication further rather than rebuild it. Sugars, I simply don't know how to relate to my relations, and I'd love your advice. Love, Closeted Atheist. Wow. Two sides of a divide. Yeah. Or at least that's how Closeted Atheist sees this. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I want to say before we begin that I was really struck by is usually when we get a letter like this where there is this divide between the adult child's faith and the parent's faith, Mm -hmm. the adult child is saying, They've been condemning of me. They've been threatening of me. You know, as a kid, they forced us down my throat and told me if I didn't believe as they believe that I would be punished. And cast out. And cast out. Right. And she's saying the opposite. She's saying, my parents have been incredibly supportive of me my whole life, and I'm so privileged to have them. So 
let's begin from a place of strength and acknowledge where the, the strength is. There is a healthy and strong bond yeah. between this adult child and her parents. Yeah. And, you know, that's a lot of ground to stand on when it comes to talking about these difficult subjects. You know, this letter is beautiful. It's incandescent in a way because it's so able to acknowledge what faith has done. You know, they say, hate the sin, don't hate the sinner. In this case, I want to say to you, closeted atheist, you can love the believers without loving the belief. And you can see what faith, stop calling it religion or God, just think of it as faith, has done for your parents. It's provided them a loving and supportive community, right? And it's also brought your dad out of a depression. And the same thing is even more profoundly true of the love and support that they've given you. That was partly the work of faith in their lives, the way that they were able to love you. They might think of that as the work of God, but you can think of it as the work of faith. I believe that, you know, whatever you call it, it's human work. Mm -hmm. But other people say, I see the hand of God there. And in the end, it doesn't matter to what, you know, that power is ascribed to. It's the fact that something allowed them to be good and loving parents to you. I actually think... My central feeling is you need to be more forgiving of your parents, you know, and maybe a little bit of yourself, because the person that you are with your set of beliefs about the world, your faith in the things that you're faithful to arises from the faith that your parents felt. Just because you love to recycle um, or you feel strongly about this or that social cause, those are values. And the one underneath that cuts underneath all that stuff, the true function of faith, is to get us to the bottom of it, Mm -hmm. which is that it is our duty as human beings to love each other, especially for uh, parents to love their children and for children to love their parents. Not to approve of how they live their lives, but to love and support them. Last Scene, a new podcast from WBUR and the Boston Globe, investigates the largest unsolved art heist in history. So about the time that he begins putting the duct tape on, he says, this is a robbery. The theft of half a billion dollars worth of art from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. When the FBI says, we solved it, we know who did it, it's like, no, you don't, because you don't have the paintings. Subscribe and listen to Last Seen Now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Sponsored by Samuel Adams and ADT Smart Home. I'm Michelle Goldberg. I'm Ross Douthat. And I'm David Leonhardt. We're the hosts of The Argument, a new podcast from the New York Times opinion section. These days, it's more important than ever to listen to people who disagree with you. Maybe they'll teach you something new. Or maybe they'll just teach you how to beat them. So listen to The Argument from The New York Times. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. So, Steve, we thought it would be a great idea to pull in somebody that's really right. interesting. That's right, because we're uncloseted atheists. Somebody who right. really knows what they're talking about. I met the extraordinary Reverend Jacqueline Lewis yes. uh, a few years ago at a workshop I was teaching at Esalen. Mm-hmm. And then I think when you came on the faculty, you met her as well. I did. She is all kinds of awesome. She's a force of nature. She's a senior minister at the Middle Collegiate Church in New York City, a writer, a thinker, a speaker, a woman of deep faith. And I think that she can really help us talk about this letter from Closeted Atheist. Let's give her a call. Hello, it's Jackie. Jackie, this is Cheryl Strayed. Cheryl Strayed! (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I missed that laugh. Hi. Steve's here. Uh, Hi, Hi, Jackie. Jackie. So we have been chatting about, we're talking about this letter from a woman who signs herself closeted atheist. Have you read the letter? I saw that. I did. Oh, my God. What a poignant letter. Yeah. Yeah. I would love it if you would tell us a bit first and our listeners about your religious background, about your faith these days, what kind of work you do at your church and so forth. Yep. Uh, You know, when I stand on my pulpit and look out at my congregation, I see 
you know, two white folks who adopted three Ethiopian children. Or, you know, I see Uncle Steve and Uncle Bob, you know, and their niece and nephew. I see black folks and white folks and Latino folks and Asian folks, old folks and young folks, all kind of bound together. So it's this place where people are Jewish, you know, and Muslim who come to Middle Church. And people are in all kinds of stages of faith, like, I really, really, really believe in God, or I'm actually having doubts. I mean, I'm a Christian pastor who believes there's more than one path to God, you know? Mm. Um, how, how could I possibly imagine that God only wants to be in relationship with people like me? You know, I wouldn't want to work for that God. Right. So, of course, God is speaking to the imam that's calling people to prayer in Oman. You know, of course, God is speaking to the rabbi doing a bris. And, of course, God is speaking even even to people who would call the voice of God the ocean roaring, you know, or mm-hmm. would call the voice of God the sunset, right? I mean, God is really talking a good game right there with that sunset. hmm all of those manifestations of the sort of image of God or the sense of God have to be valid in the human community if we say we love each other, if we're going to love God even. Um, one of my favorite scriptures says, how can we love God whom we can't see if we don't love our neighbor who we can see? Yeah, mm, That's beautiful. So I think I would want to say that you know, the best of what religion has to offer, or the best of what faith has to offer, is an organizing principle. Cheryl, you you had an organizing principle experience when you walked, you know, walked on the on the wild way. You know, That's you right. Know. On the PCT, right. On the PCT. There's a way in which faith just reminds us of our goodness, helps us to imagine how to create the world we want. And if faith isn't doing that, I think it's too small. I think it's too too puny, you know? And I think people walk away from that kind of faith at some time, and maybe maybe that's what our atheist, our private atheist has experienced, yeah. you know? And it's a very millennial, it's a very, millennials and boomers, I'm a boomer, have a lot in common around this faith access. Boomers are often disenfranchised, um, disillusioned, have let go of a bunch of the faith stuff, and millennials are absolutely clear that there's more than one path to God. You know, if there's a God, if there's something at work in the world that's making love and justice, they're excited about that, but they might go to the yoga studio to get it, right? They might go dancing to get it. So this question about, I'm, I'm going to say getting a grown-up God, I left my parents' God a long time ago. I had to get an intelligent, not magical thinking, you know, right. um, relationship with a God that kind of keeps pace with my intellect and well, my what passion. Was, can you tell us about your, you know, your trajectory there? Sure. How did you grow up in terms of your religious yeah. background? My mom and dad are the most open-minded folks of their age they can be. They're, you know, they're 78 and 81. But they grew up in Mississippi, and they grew up Southern Baptist. So they grew up, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, mm-hmm. you know. Um, we keep the Ten Commandments. You know, you never lie. I mean, so their code, their ethics are still mine. Like, I didn't outgrow that. But I did outgrow messages like, I mean, women aren't supposed to talk in church, they told me when I was a little girl. Are mm-hmm. you kidding me? I talk every Sunday in church. <laughs> you know? um, the Bible says, literal, um, literal interpretation of the Bible, they didn't have a pastor who had gone to seminary, even, you know, to sort of say, here's the historical context, here's what's going on with this background, and here's an, another way to think about it. So they were very um, liberal, biblical, Baptist people who took their children to a Presbyterian church, because it was close by, where we could feel the difference between the God of judgment and punishment, and God of grace and love. Mm. We could feel it, even as little children. So they took us to places that would open up our hearts and minds. Mm. And then, of course, I went to seminary. And what has happened for me in my, I'm 50-something now, is I'm really, I have a deeper faith, I think, actually, than ever before. And the faith I have is in both 
this love that is the mystery that I can't describe, when you and Steve and I are on this phone call, there is something at work that is beautiful, right, and powerful. And we turn our attention toward closet atheists together. There's a beautiful thing that happens when there's more than one of us. Yeah. And I believe so deeply in the indomitable spirit of the human being. I just, I just think people are amazing. So that's what has shifted for me. Beautiful. So in your parish as a minister, I'm going to guess that you know a lot of people who have crossed this divide. So they were raised in a faith and they are deeply, deeply enmeshed with their Christian identity. And this young woman is afraid to make that announcement. I am not one of you anymore. I am not a Christian. What have you said to people in her situation? I'm thinking about a, one particular member of mine who's in her 70s, and she had a series of, of tragedies happen over the last 10 years, almost every year. She lost an uncle, or she lost a lover, or she lost her great auntie, I and mean, just death after death after death. And she lost her job, and she lost her ability to move, mm. her knees gave up on her, you know, just everything you can imagine. And she kind of got into this place of like, well, what's wrong with the contract I have with God? You know, hey, I did all the right stuff, and then God sort of let her down. And we had this really fascinating few months of counseling, Sugars, where I said, you know, I think you need to get a new God. I said, the God that you kind of grew up thinking was going to answer your every need, seems like that God has gone away. What kind of relationship do you want now? And let's imagine that. And we started talking about partnership instead of, like, I'm a puppet or, you know, a pawn. Mm -hmm. And it really, really worked for her to reimagine God, not as someone who she had to please, okay, in order to get stuff she wanted, not as someone who would leave her and divorce her if she failed to be perfect, but more as someone that was an ally and a partner in her life. So my religion is love, right? I don't care if you believe in God, even. I don't care how you name the God you believe in. Do you believe in love? And I would want to say to positive atheists, you know, what you and your parents have in common is love, love for each other. And in the common space of love, perhaps she can, respecting her parents' faith, really show herself to them, like out of love for them. She just takes a risk, and shows them who she is, tells them who she is. Right. I believe in human rights, mom and dad. Right. I believe in the LGBT cause because I care about every person that's vulnerable. I believe in the ecology because I know that the planet is precious. I believe, okay, in feminism because women have rights. All of that is a beautiful religion, isn't it? Right. It is. Another thing I was struck by with this woman, and I think we see this a lot with people who grew up in families where God was not that kind of seeking that I think the three of us have been describing, but rather a very specific thing. And that this is a, a woman who's had God defined for her in incredibly right. sort of strong and limited terms. And so what she's saying is, I reject that God. Correct. And so because exactly of that, right. I'm rejecting all God. This is why she's calling herself an atheist. And I don't mean to question whether she's an atheist or not, but I'm intrigued by your conversation with the with a woman you spoke of, uh, the 70-year-old who'd had all these misfortunes, and you said, well, maybe it's not I believe in God or not. It's redefining what God is or how I think about the divine presence in our lives. And I think that so much about evolving in a spiritual way is about you know, questioning the things that we were told and testing them to see if they're still true. And certainly this closeted atheist her parents' vision of God is not true for her anymore, you know? And so to say to her parents, like, it's not, I'm not a Christian. It's saying in my adult life now, I'm seeking. Hmm. I I love the way you're formulating it, because rather than saying, I'm not a Christian, she could say, here are my beliefs. And in fact, um, my beliefs aren't in moral conflict with the church, or at least my core beliefs are actually a part of the church, the idea of service, the ethos of service. And her parents parents would connect to that. Rather than thinking of it as a binary, you're yeah. either a Christian and you're, you know, going to have a certain life and an afterlife, or you're not a Christian, you know, you, you don't have to accept that part of your parents' faith. 
you can say, I am a Christian insofar as I consider the earth sacred. You know, I consider the poor and the meek to be partly my moral responsibility and the rights of the vulnerable and so on. That's clearly what your set of beliefs are. In fact, don't fall into the trap of feeling that you have to say you're either Christian or not Christian. It's more, can you accept and love your parents for who they are? And can you bring them into an awareness of what your beliefs are and the fact that you might share a lot more than you imagine? Mm Mm-hmm. And I want to say, too, this isn't probably going to be one conversation with your parents, Closeted mm-hmm. Atheists. This is Amen. a series of conversations. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, one of the things, so you say, I don't know how to be there for my mom as she talked about grandma, quote, now being with Jesus. And I think that discomfort, it doesn't rise out of the fact that your mother finds solace in the idea that your grandmother's with Jesus. Your discomfort rises out of the fact that you have made yourself complicit and invisible, that that she's assuming that you also believe that your grandma is with Jesus. But once you sort of open that door and you're more transparent about your own beliefs, what happens then is you're not threatened by other people having theirs. You know, when you feel defensive about something, you're uncomfortable when simply people talk about who they are, how they feel. And I think that 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 feeling of defensiveness is beneath that cloak of secrecy. But once you, you cast that cloak away and say, Thank you. Thank you for giving me such a a life full of love and support. And thank you also for sharing your faith with me in my upbringing. It's contributed so much to who I am today. But who I am today reflects values that I have grown into, and here's what they are. And so I really encourage you to be brave enough to do that. It will make for probably some uncomfortable conversations, some conversations that sometimes even feel like, um, you know, that you leave with the conflict unresolved. But it's the beginning of a journey that I think will end up somewhere beautiful. I think that's so beautiful what you both said. And I want to add this to to the dear Eve who's wondering about whether she's going to get kicked out of the garden. You are out of the garden. You're out of the garden. We get out of our parents' gardens, I think, but when we go to kindergarten, you know? (laughs) (laughs) We we move into the world where new things influence us and change us. We dare to step into other realities and new ways of being. And that's the most important part of growing up is that. And so trust yourself, trust your instincts, own your faith. The things you believe in is your faith. The things that matter to you is your faith. That's your faith, and you get to have it and embrace that. Parents need us to grow them up. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what's supposed to happen. We get out of the garden, (laughs) and we grow them up because they come to understand that we are distinct from them. We are adult people with our own stuff, and they learn to celebrate that. Hmm. That is the hope. You know, one of the things that I I love about when I, I hear somebody speak about religion that cuts beneath dogma is that there's so much humility in it and really an acceptance of doubt. And what I oftentimes, the trap I fell into when I was younger and being kind of a self-righteous atheist, uh, you know, kind of trying to push back, I feel a little bit just traces of in the idea of closeted atheist sitting at that table, listening to her mother feel reassured and comforted because grandma, her mother, is, you know, in heaven or uh, talking about uh, God's will. Oftentimes we retreat from a dogma by sort of creating our own dogma in which there's no doubt right. and there's no mm-hmm. humility. And then we do feel like an outsider because now yeah. there are two sides. The truth is, who knows? Maybe your grandmother is with Jesus. We don't know. Have the humility yeah. to accept that there are lots of paths to God. And if you can be accepting of yours, then that means you have to be accepting of your parents. And you know if the yeah. atheist Jew is saying that your grandmother might be with Jesus. Oi, Gavalt. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's something. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story. Okay. I'll tell you a story from from the almond vault, and this is really a, a, a crazy thing, but it's part of the history. You know, my great grandfathers were rabbis, and one of them, Morris Rosenthal, was a, what they call a yeshiva bachar. He he basically traveled around learning uh, God's law, uh, staying in other people's homes, a very devout ascetic life, totally devoted to religious dogma and that long list of rules that that you know sort of Leviticus set of rules that even gets more crazy and refine the deeper you go into uh, Talmudic Judaism. And so this is where he was coming from. And he went to gymnasium. He went to a class at the university. And this astonishing thing happened to him. He uh, saw a professor 
uh, release a spray of water and then shine light behind the water. And it created a rainbow in the middle of the yeah. classroom. And at that moment, he lost his faith in that other God that he had learned about that had all those rules that were supposed to tell you exactly how you're supposed to behave in every possible human situation. And I guess the splendor of that and the wonder of the fact that man could create a rainbow right there in the middle of a university classroom made him find a different path to faith. And, you know, that doesn't mean that he wasn't a person of deep faith. He just, in that moment, found another path. Oh, that's so cool. I love that story. That's a great story. Wow. That's a great, great story. You know, Jackie, I've had many moments with you at Esalen and with Steve making this show and so forth, where I have that feeling that God is there. But probably none so much is that final day of that one year of our writing workshop that the whole group just sort of spontaneously came together and you began to sing a song and we all joined in with you. Do you remember that? Yes. What, I was, <laughs> what was the song? What was the song? It was a beautiful non-religious song called I Feel Good by James Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was singing and dancing and clapping. It was beautiful. It was a holy moment. Yes. Because we were whole together. I feel good. Thank you so much for being on our show, Jackie. We hope you come back again to talk to us. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to. I'm so glad you guys put Shirley back on the airwaves. Yay. Yay. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. I just adore her and admire her. And, you know, she just, she's really a wise woman and and a spiritual leader. Yeah, you can hear it. And, you know, you know, when you're in the presence of grace, it becomes apparent very quickly. And, you know, the beautiful thing about uh, people like that is they, you get a little bit of it yourself. You feel it inside. And I hope that closeted atheists, you know, you will 